What are some ridiculous history facts? In 1895, the entire state of Ohio had only two cars. Both cars managed to still smash into each other. 101 years ago a massive tank of molasses burst opening Boston, causing a sticky wave that killed 21 people and injured well over 100. The Great Molasses Flood spread at about 35 miles per hour. Abraham Lincoln's son Robert Todd Lincoln was present at three different presidential assassinations. After McKinley, he decided not to accept any more invitations. Also also, Robert Lincoln's life was saved by John Wilkes Booth's brother, Edwin, a famous actor, who pulled him out from a train that was about to drag him under its wheels. Am I remembering correctly far the other Booths weren't really on board with John's whole racist president shooting drama? Edwin, an abolitionist sympathizer, was really pretty ashamed of John. When Alexander the Great was a child he was reprimanded by a teacher for wastefully throwing two whole fistfuls of rare incense into a sacrificial fire. When he was an adult and captured Gaza, which happened to be the prime agricultural source of the incense he wasted, he sent home 18 tons of it home to the same teacher as a gift. The first known political cartoon is Egyptian, and shows a Chepsit, the only woman pharaoh, pegging her lover and chief architect Senmet. There's a children's book called, The Pharaoh's Secret that kinda gets into this. Interesting book. The entire country of Malta was awarded the George Cross for its efforts in WWII. It's still on their flag. Interestingly enough, it sounds like the conditions for the awarding of the cross are kind of similar to how the Knights Hospitalia operated back in the Sword and Shield days. If you're unfamiliar, they were more or less a precursor to the Red Cross and the first real paramedics. Carol Marx's great great grandson has a YouTube video of him doing parka, called exclamation marks. I watched it, and it's not actually bad or anything. Just funny considering his lineage. Former US President Andrew Jackson was approached by a man who pulled a gun on him. Smaller history fact this was the first assassination attempt on a US President the man pulled the trigger and the cap went off, but the gunpowder failed to light. The man pulled a second gun and fired, but the gunpowder again failed to light. The assassin tried to get away, but not before Andrew Jackson got him, and beat the out of him with a cane. Potatoes were not very popular as a food in France. Like they were seen as fit only for animals. Not only that, but they were considered generally not digestible by humans. So a pharmacist named Parmentier knew they were good food, and wanted to popularize them among the working class. So he got a two acre farm to grow potatoes, and placed armed guards around it at all times. People assumed armed guards meant something very valuable was growing there, so they began to steal the potatoes. That's how potatoes became popular in France's working class. He also told his guards to accept bribes, and to not actually catch anyone. Man that seems like such a good job. Your job is to guard this area, but don't actually guard it, just look like you are. It's like me right this second using Reddit while at work. People know no different, and it looks like I'm looking up important information. I'm not. During the Cold War. There was an idea, to drop XL condoms labeled medium onto the Soviets, to make them think we were anatomically superior, and be more afraid of fighting us. Easily my favorite part of American history. Whoops I dropped my monster condom for my magnum dong. American military members were also killed during the nuclear bombings of Japan. When American high command was informed of their presence their response was something like, targets remain unchanged. Pepsi once had the 6th largest military in the world after the price of Russian vodka couldn't cover their deal for Pepsi products. So they traded 17 submarines, a frigate, a cruiser, and a destroyer for a trade deal. Fun fact. The president of PepsiCo at the time told the national security advisor we are disarming the USSR faster than you are. Gorbachev appeared in a Pizza Hut commercial. Hitler. Stalin. Trotsky. Freud and Tito were all living in the same area of Vienna in 1913. General Omar Bradley was stopped by MP during the Battle of the Bulge in WW2 due to them thinking he was an Nazi infiltrator. The irony was that he was stopped because he correctly identified the capital of Illinois as Springfield when the officer thought it was Chicago. I've met plenty of people who thought Chicago was the capital of Illinois just because it's our most populated city. Montenegro technically was in war with Japan for 101 years and they signed a peace treaty in 2006. 
Montenegro was allied with Russia in Russo-Japanese war and they declared war on Japan, but they forgot to peace. Not the only time this happened in history. The Scilly Islands were at war with the Netherlands for quite a while, if I recall correctly. Edit. Wikipedia link. Some people dispute it. But here's a wiki link. Further edit. List of similar wars. In 1967 Australian Prime Minister Harold Holt disappeared while swimming in the ocean. He was presumed drowned. So naturally that year we named a swim centre after him in memoriam. Edit. Added his name. Which I meant to do when I wrote the post, but obviously my brain snapped midway through the sentence and I forgot it. 1904 Olympic Marathon in Street. Louis. The one finisher drove most of the race. He started the race. Got tired and heat exhausted and wanted to drop out. He got in a car to DQ himself and head back to the stadium, but along the way, realized he was near the finish line and got out to claim the glory. The two finisher was carried across the finish line by his trainers. On a bogus suit oceans theory, the trainers had been giving him a mixture of brandy, egg whites, and rat poison instead of water. When it came out that the one finisher had driven most of the course, this guy was given the gold despite the help from his trainers to finish. For some reason. The three finisher was just a regular guy who did nothing unusual. In this case, ordinary was extraordinary. The four finisher was a Cuban mailman, who had raised the money to attend the Olympics by running around his entire country and asking for donations. When he landed in New Orleans, he lost all the money gambling. He managed to scrounge enough to get a street, Louis and attend the Olympics. However, he had no money for athletic gear. So he ran in dress shoes and pants hacked off at the knee by a fellow racer who happened to have a knife. He probably would have come in first had it not been for the hour long nap he took on the side of the road. After eating rotten apples he found at an orchard near the course. The 9 and 12 finishers were from South Africa and ran barefoot. South Africa didn't actually send a delegation. These were students who just happened to be in town and thought it sounded fun. 9 was chased a mile off course by angry dogs. Half the participants had never raced competitively before. Some died. Street. Louis only had one water stop on the entire run. This, coupled with the dusty road, and exacerbated by the cars kicking up dust, lead to several fatalities. The Russian delegation arrived a week late because they were still using the Julian calendar until 1918, while effectively the rest of the world had switched to the Gregorian calendar. Credit to you slash Draken underscore Barathean for this synopsis which I have shamelessly stolen and tweaked just a little for clarity and brevity. This was the most early 1900s thing I've ever read in my entire life. Every sporting event in the early 1900s was basically an episode of wacky races. Once FDR died, Truman didn't know about the Manhattan Project, but when he found out he subtly tried to tell Stalin they were working on something big. Stalin was like yeah dude, I knew before you did. Since he had so many spies in America. Henry Cavendish. The man who was vital in the discovery of gases and discovered hydrogen. He inherited a ton of money from his uncle, and built a special castle, I think. He was incredibly introverted, so it was designed so that he never had to meet or see any of his servants. He communicated with them through notes only. He did, however, appreciate other scientists coming to visit and talk. His works mostly came after his death of course, but I found this guy interesting. In 1908. There was a car race around the world that started in New York City. The route would start in New York City to San Francisco to Valdez, Alaska, across the Bering Strait, through Russia and Europe, with the finish line in Paris. Cars were relatively new and road infrastructure was limited to only metropolitan areas and even then, a lot of it was cobbled stone. But what you might have thought, is how in the world can a car get across the Pacific? Duh. They would drive across the Bering Strait during the winter, when it froze into an ice bridge silly. The race began in February 1908 and immediately ran into challenges. To list a few. Cars breaking down multiple times. Lack of usable roads. Car hating people giving wrong directions and oh yeah. Snow. The first team reached San Francisco in 41 days. But quickly realized that the proposed route from San Francisco to Alaska did not exist. So the organizers allowed teams to ship their cars to Valdez. Alaska then continue on the ice bridge. Once in Valdez. The teams found out that there is in fact no ice bridge across the Bering Strait anymore because it melted 20. 000 years ago. Small oversight. Organizers then allowed teams to ship their cars across the Pacific to Japan and Russia to carry on. 
despite all unpredictable and hilariously predictable odds. The winning team arrived in Paris 169 days later. Highly recommend to listen about it from the dollop podcast. There's more nonsense that happens that I couldn't fit in slash remember. Where's the Bering Strait Ice Bridge? I swear it was here yesterday. Hannibal's defeat of the Romans at Lago Trasimeno. By leaving soldiers to light fires in the hills, he created the illusion that his army was three days march away, when tens of thousands of men were actually concealed in the hills just above the lake. The Romans were surprised on the shore and trapped between the onslaught and the water. In their armor, half of the 30, 000 Roman troops were either killed in battle or drowned in the lake. 5,000 were captured, and the other 10, 000 staggered back to Rome creating panic that the greatest army in the world had just been handed their ass by a Carthaginian upstart. It was the greatest ambush in military history. During the Viking era, there was a leader named Sigurd. He allied with a Viking warlord named Thorstein. He wanted to conquer more land and expand his territory. He had already been very successful in doing so. This was until he feuded with another leader called Melbuktooth or Meltusk. As his front two teeth were abnormally large and bucktoothed, they decided to settle their matters on the battlefield and both agreed on bringing 40 men each for the battle. However, Sigurd ignored the terms and brought 80 men. Bucktoothed had realized he had been betrayed, but did not give up. They killed a number of Sigurd's men, but alas, they were overpowered and were all killed. Here's the catch. After the battle, Sigurd ordered his men to behead all the enemies and tie them to their saddles as trophies. However, as Sigurd rode home in victory, the severed head of Bucktoothed pierced his leg, which lead to an infection, killing him soon after. The capture of the Dutch fleet at Den Helder on the night of the 23rd of January 1795 presents a rare occurrence of a naval battle between warships and cavalry, in which a French revolutionary Hussar regiment captured a Dutch Republican fleet frozen at anchor between the 3 kilometers 1. 9 mile stretch of sea that separates the mainland port of Den Helder and the island of Texel. After a charge across the frozen Zuiderzee, the French cavalry captured 14 Dutch ships and 850 guns. A capture of ships by horsemen is an extremely rare feat in military history. Sounds like something that would happen in a civilization game. In ancient Egypt, servants were smeared with honey to attract flies away from the pharaoh. That's so dumb. Why not just put the honey on a statue or something? I mean, you'd still need servants to carry the statue around, so just skip the middleman. I'm imagining this was for when they were out and about. The state of Washington was named Washington instead of Columbia, so that it wouldn't be confused with the District of Columbia, as it was commonly known at the time. There used to be bread stamps burned into a cooked loaf of bread. To avoid bread fraud, as the government supplied the wheat slash flour, but some bakers tried to use sawdust and other ingredients in the bread to make the wheat last longer. The bread stamps were baker specific, so they could track down where any tainted bread came from. If they were caught, they had to move to another town to make bread, or wait three years to continue making bread, if I remember correctly. Bread laws were huge throughout most of history, nowadays. The idea of the government so strictly regulating an industry that they are forced to sell at a certain price seems odd, but in a time when food shortages were always a danger and food reserves were slim, bread becomes a very important commodity. It's how the Roman emperors kept Rome quiet despite the fact it was such an absurdly huge city, literally bread and circuses. Free bread, free water, and free entertainment. Colombia has a period in history literally called the dumb homeland period because of how incredibly dumb politicians acted at the time. How long ago? 180 years more or less. But yes, some say it never stopped. Before Abraham Lincoln became a politician, he was a champion wrestler. With more than 300 bouts under his belt, Lincoln only lost one match in his career and was inducted into the National Wrestling Hall of Fame in 1992. He also jumped out of a window in order to prevent a quorum. Defenestrated himself. Diostratus is the guy who burned down the temple of Artemis. The only reason he did it was to have his name written down in history. A law was also passed that made it illegal to write down his name for just that reason. Obviously, it is not enforced in modern times. That's where you're wrong, bucko. You're going to jail 